I did not. Mother. Fuck. Hello. Uh. Hi. I did not put any e-liquid in this. And then I started this. I was so proud of myself. I started on time. I thought I had all my shit set up. My drinks, the books are here. The cat mountain's here. The lights are on. All on time. Um, I even had the, the setup for a uh, game afterward. Completely set up. All I gotta do is turn everything on and uh to shorten the in between time frame and uh i didn't put i didn't put elip in there i didn't put it's completely empty that's that bodes well for me um the question is should i pause it and go fill that up or should i just fuck it <sighs> That's so disappointing for me. I was on top of literally everything else. I... <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Fill it up. I... Yeah, I thought I was ready to go. I thought I was ready to go. Okay, hold on. Oh, I gotta unhook myself. Hold on. Uh, uno momento. Uh. Oh, God! The fuck? Fantastic. Trip over everything in the building. Why is there shit all over my floor? Eight foot long mic cord. Eight foot long mic cord. Happy Pride. It's Pride Month, gang. And you know what that means. I... Oof. All right, let's fill it up. Started the so gung ho. Started started the. I was on top of it. I was on top of it. And then I just blanked on that one thing. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool how we do that? Isn't that cool how I didn't even? Where's my cat? Oh no! Oh god! I found it. Okay. Like, you're making food to share with me? That is so nice. Thank you. Thank you for the heart. Thanks, Nico. Good to see you. Uh, that's so nice. I have not eaten. I Should I have eaten? Yes. But did I make my coffee into a protein shake? Yes, I did. I, um... I, yes, I have water. Um, I did drink water today, uh, ironically. I didn't eat, but I have drank plenty of water. Um, and I worked out today, so, like, why didn't I eat? I don't know. Um, I had to schedule a mental breakdown for yesterday, so all of the adult things that I was going to do yesterday, um, well, I scheduled a mental breakdown for that day. And I was just going to be like, I can do laundry next week. It's fine. I have socks. And <laughs> then at, uh, and I was going to get back into um, Shinzo after a long hiatus. And uh, I, but funny enough, those are my everyday contacts. I wear those contacts every day. They're prescription. And I don't like wearing my glasses. So I wear the purple ones pretty much every day um and one of them slipped down the drain <laughs> so that was fun you're why professor oak asks in the intro <laughs> thank you i'm taking that as a compliment uh so yeah that was a huge bummer i have another set of contacts um coming in and when i get them 
Um, that's going to be um, the next cosplay I get back into. Because uh, I haven't done it in a while, and I, I wanted to, while I'm in the middle, I'm in the middle of putting together several other things, um, con cosplay-wise, with um, some wigs that I got going on. I've been working on Yarlothotep, uh, and I've been working on Mendecum from Death Parade, and I have <laughs> not finished either of them into where I'm happy with them. Uh, so I'm in the middle of several things, working on several different projects cosplay-wise, and um, Shinzo is easy and something I know how to do. I get the makeup down in record time. I got everything. I So, and then that happened. And I was like, cool, no contacts. Awesome. I have one purple contact. That'll definitely... So, yeah, mines aren't purple today. They're just green, like normal. Boo. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have to wait for that. That was a total bummer. So since that happened, I was like, well, I'll get my adult stuff handled today. And uh, some of them I tried to do and failed at. And other things, I got some things done. So uh, I'm not in cosplay today. Sorry, guys. I dropped the ball on that one. Or the contact. Uh, slip right down the drain. No hesitation. <laughs> hi, Toby. Everybody say hi to Toby. Toby needs uh, his own introduction. Or he doesn't calm down. So hi, Toby. Hi, Cuddles. Uh, I don't know if Ray's here yet. But hi, hi to all the pets. And if... Uh, your pet is here with you, uh, and I just know I love and appreciate them. All of your pets are the best boy and or girl, and I hope you know that and treat them accordingly. Uh, but yeah, so my plans got scrapped for the day, uh, except for this. I get book club, and that's, that's it. I get book club. And, yeah, the mental breakdown uh, w was um, okay. It went exactly according to schedule. And then I decompressed by playing Moonlighter the entire day yesterday. <laughs> by the way, I have new games for game night. Um, Moonlighter is one of them. That's the game Dad keeps talking about. I have, um, because I sent, I sent Ray, uh, a clip of it and I'll, I'll put it in discord for anybody else who wants to see it. There's a song I sent Ray cause Cuddles tried to offer the other day. <laughs> they nicked her real good, uh, nicked them real good. And so there's a game called she wants me dead and it's about a cat trying to kill its owner. And I forgot all about it until the other day. And then I was like. How come I never got that game? And it was because at the time I didn't have a Switch. And I was like, ooh, I have a Switch. So I got the game so we can play that. Uh, I also got Hollow Knight, which is extremely infuriating and very hard. Uh, so I will attempt that one. But Kazette, She Wants Me Dead is at least something you're supposed to die at repeatedly. A Hollow Knight, I feel like I am just bad at it. <laughs> And I haven't fully gotten it down. I'm getting there. I've only beat the first boss, and it's very hard. So I would be willing to uh, play any of those. I also got Amnesia because I got nostalgic, but I don't know if you... <laughs> Amnesia's kind of old at this point. <laughs> if you want to watch someone play Amnesia, you could play someone way better than me. Watch someone way better than me play it. So <laughs> it's an option. It's not like a big option. I think that's the vibe. That's what I witnessed anyway. Oh, for what? Hollow Knight? Hollow Knight's just really hard. I, like, Google it, and everybody on Reddit, even, like, people who are, like, big in gaming, like, I found a Reddit post of someone who has clearly played a lot of games, but was like, am I just supposed to, like, have something that I don't have, and don't say get good. And then a bunch of the comments were like, you just gotta get good at it, bro. And he was like, 
no. <laughs> and so that was fun. And uh, I am bad at Hollow Knight. <laughs> I don't know if that would be a good option for stream, but we could try it. If you want to watch me die a lot. Uh, she wants me dead. You're at least supposed to die. It's one of those... Uh, like early Super Mario Brother, like side scroller, like you die a whole lot. <sighs> Hollow Knight or? Because I would be happy to. I'm the, I don't want anybody to get bored of Binding of Isaac. I love Binding of Isaac and I can play it at any time, but I know uh, I can play Hollow Knight. I'll die a lot, but you can see it. <laughs> It's very cute. I don't know how they took a game that's like that aesthetically pleasing and adorable um, into the most infuriation uh, I have ever experienced. I, for reference, there's, you have to like get into areas that are unlocked by, uh, it's sort of like a puzzle. You got to figure out which thing goes with which area. Um, and... I, I'm pretty sure to get into a specific area, I need a lantern, which you have to purchase from a shop. Now, I got the dude, the shop unlocked, because you have to find the people in the place, and then they go up top, and they're like, you should come visit my shop sometime, and then they go up top, and then the shop opens up top, and you unlock it. I unlocked it, and I feel like I need the lantern, and it's like 1800 Geo. On average, you get Geo by defeating enemies. On average, the average enemy drops about three Geo per drop. Unless you beat, like, a boss or, like, a big dude or something. Um, it takes a long time to harvest that much. And in Hollow Knight, when you die, um, you leave behind a shade. It's like a little ghost dude. And you are... Brought back to life at your last rest point, which is like a little bench in the middle of fucking nowhere. And you come back on the bench and you have full health again, but you have to, you lose all your money. All your geo is gone. And to get it back, you have to go find your shade and kill your shade. Now, the thing is, is that if you die in a specific location, the same enemies respawn. So whatever you died from is also there and your shade. So now you have to beat both of those things without dying again or you lose all your money. So I had gotten like almost a thousand Geo yesterday and I was saving up for this lantern. I was like, all right, I'm feeling good. I'm doing well. I, you know, and I'm progressing decently into the only other area that I had unlocked, which was Green Path, and I'm walking along, and I die, because of course I do. Um, and I was like, no, all my Geo, I have to get back and kill my Shade. I go all the way back. I somehow make it all the way back there without losing my life again. And then I die when I got to the same enemy that I had dropped to last time and before I had killed my shade and I was back to zero and it had taken me hours to get that much geo and I was like I think I'm gonna take a break it's just a game it's just a game <laughs> and then I played Moonlighter the rest of the night because <laughs> that was easier than Hollow Knight and somehow still hard. Uh, <laughs> I had lost hours of work. And I have tried getting through Green Path, but there's like constantly you were under the impression in the game that you were supposed to be able to do things that you just can't do because you're bad at it. And uh, so for the longest time I was trying to get into an area, I'm pretty sure I need an item for that lets you jump higher. And I was just like, am I just bad at jumping? Am I just bad at jumping? It feels like I should be able to reach it. Like I'm this close.
from reaching it and I just can't reach it. And I feel like it's because I'm bad at jumping. Am I bad at jumping? I'm pressing the corresponding buttons. get me in there and it's all it's very infuriating so we'll see i'll play hollow knight for a while and see how it goes hopefully you guys don't because it's a lot it's going to be a lot of the same two environments because i have not progressed and i feel like i have to beat the boss in green path i found the boss in green path i think it locked me in there like a boss so it's feels like a boss um and i've unlocked precisely one ability in the game and that is to shoot soul energy so it's like a long range attack and it blasts through shielded enemies the thing is is it lasts about as long as however much soul you have which is about three charges so you can hit it three times Apart from that, once you run out of soul, you have to get more by defeating other enemies. The thing is, when you're locked in a boss room, it's just you and the boss. And after you use up those charges, there's no other enemy to defeat but the boss. And the boss is shielded. <laughs> so I use up my three charges. He doesn't kick it. And now I'm just locked in there with certain death. Um... How do? How, how, how do? And I can't get more soul. And I can't leave. So the only other option is die. I feel like I'm missing an important ability I should have. And I did not look it up when I died last time. So I might look it up and try Hollow Knight and see if I can beat it. We'll see how that goes. Hollow Knight's hard. So. But. Um, we got a book to read. There's some people missing. I know. Um, I only saw one in Discord. But then again, I didn't check Discord before. I, that's not my phone. That's my only the case. My phone is right there. I don't know why I picked it up like I thought that was going to be my phone. I was going to check Discord real quick. Can't check Discord. So, we got a book to read, um, but we're lacking some people, and that makes me nervous. Quite a number of people. Insomniac's not here. Uh, I don't know if I've seen Ray in here. I don't know if Ray is uh, dipping in and out, or if they're at work, or... But I think this is what we're gonna get. So that is where I'm gonna call it, I guess. Who's ready to read a book? Emmy will not be here, yeah. I knew that one. That was the one I saw on Discord. Um, but I missed everybody else. Two, okay. We left off in a bit of a weird area last time because um, if there's one thing you need to know about Ransom Riggs is he doesn't know how to make chapter lengths more uniform uh, and split things in a more viable manner. So uh, we left off at a bit of a funky place and we're sort of at the tail end of chapter 10. Sweet. Okay. Well, then it's just going to be us palling around tonight. Um, and oh, 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 thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Um, we're reading Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, book two. This isn't a regular live where I talk and stuff. I read you a book. So if you want a bedtime story or you just want to relax and listen to something since you uh, maybe find it hard to read analog style, I'm going to tell you a story. And we do this every week, and it's a Tuesday at 8 p.m. So, and if you have no recollection of this particular series, or you've never read it, 
uh, and you want to catch up, you can do so on my YouTube. I have all the rest of it. We've read the complete book one and most of book two, and it is all on my YouTube. So if you don't know where you're at or you want to learn where you're at, that's where you do it. You could also just get the book by Ransom Riggs. Uh, I highly advocate for it. It's a neat book. So, we're going to dive in. We left off last time. They had found a loop. They found an unlikely single alive companion uh, in the two silent boys. Um, well, they're pretty creepy. But we are looking for Miss Wren, and the peculiar children are lost in London in the middle of World War II. So, not a great place. Not a great time. And they came across two sisters, Sam and Esme, whose voices I may not be able to do correctly today. We're gonna see how it works out. Um, couple disclosures before we pick up from where we left off. One, I'm not quacking, it's obnoxious. You'll find out what I mean very shortly. Two, if you feel uncomfortable about clowns. There's a clown. There's a picture of a clown. Um, the clown is just a bit creepy. Clown doesn't necessarily do anything. But if you don't like clowns, um, I will try and warn you when the clown comes up, or at least I will warn you before the picture. Because they go through a whole so sideshow thing. So, anybody afraid of clowns? We only have seven people in here. Is anybody afraid of clowns before we start? Clown phobia, anybody? Clowns just make me uncomfortable, but I know there's people legitimately afraid of clowns. Nope. We get on the clown thing. Cool, I just thought I would mention it because I just find clowns mildly irritating and uh, they confuse me and they make me uncomfortable. Um, anyway, cool, then that is off the table. And once again, you'll know about the quacking I just wanted to pre-emphasize. It's hard enough doing one, a couple of the voices anyway. I'm not going to try and incorporate quacking into it. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, all right. Pick up where we left off. Which was right after, unfortunately, Sam and Esme maybe lost their house. We had questions, lots of questions. As Esme's tears began to fade, we worked up the courage to ask them, did Sam realize she was peculiar? She knew she was different, she said, but had never heard the term peculiar. Had she ever lived in a loop? She had not. A what? Which meant she was just as old as she appeared to be. Twelve, she said. Had no Imbrin ever come to find her? Someone came once, she answered. There were others, like me, but to join them, I would have had to leave Esme behind. Esme can't do anything? I asked. I can count backward from 100 in a duck voice, Esme volunteered through her sniffles and then began to demonstrate quacking. 100, 99, 98. And before she could get any further, Esme was interrupted by a siren, this one high-pitched and moving fast in our direction. An ambulance careened into the alley and raced towards us, its headlights blacked out so that only pinpricks of light shone through. It skidded to a stop nearby, cut its siren, and a driver leapt out. Is anyone hurt? the driver said, rushing over to us. He wore a rumpled gray uniform and a dented metal hat, and though he was full of energy, his face looked haggard, like he hadn't slept in days. His eyes met the hole in Sam's chest, and he dropped dead in his tracks. Cor, blimey! Sam got to her feet. 
It's nothing, really, she said. I'm fine. And to demonstrate how fine she was, she passed her fist in and out of the hole a few times and did a jumping jack. The medic fainted. Hmm, said Hugh, nudging the fallen man with his foot. You'd think these chaps would have been made of tougher stuff. Since he's clearly unfit for service, I say we borrow his ambulance, Enoch said. There's no knowing where in the city that pigeon's leading us. If it's far, it could take us all night to reach Miss Wren on foot. Horace, who'd been sitting on a chunk of wall, sprang to his feet. That's a fine idea, he said. It's a reprehensible idea, Bronwyn said. You can't steal an ambulance. Injured persons need it. We're injured persons, Horace whined. We need it. It's hardly the same thing. St. Bronwyn, Enoch said sarcastically. Are you so concerned with the well-being of normals that you'd risk Miss Peregrine's life to protect a few of theirs? A, hun a thousand of them aren't worth one of her, or one of us, for that matter. Bronwyn gasped. What a thing to say in front of... Sam stalked toward Enoch with a humorless look on her face. Look here, boy, she said. If you imply that my sister's life is worthless again, I will clobber you. Calm down. I wasn't referring to your sister. I only meant that... I know exactly what you meant, and I'll clobber you if you say it again. I'm sorry if I've offended your delicate sensibilities, Enoch said, his voice rising in exasperation. But you've never had an embryon, an, an embryon, and you've never lived in a loop, and so you couldn't possibly understand that this, right now, is not real, strictly speaking. It's the past. The life of every normal in this city has already been lived. Their fates are predetermined, no matter how many ambulances we steal. So it doesn't bloody matter, you see. Looking a bit baffled, Sam said nothing, but continued to give Enoch the evil eye. Even so, said Bronwyn, it's not right to make people suffer unnecessarily. We can't take the ambulance. That's all well and good, but think of Miss Peregrine, said Millard. She can't have more than a day left. Our group seemed evenly divided between stealing the ambulance or going on foot, so we put it to a vote. I myself was against taking it, but mostly because the roads were so pocked with bomb holes that I didn't know how we'd drive the thing. Emma took the vote. Who's for taking the ambulance? She said. A few hands shot up. And against? Suddenly there was a loud pop from the direction of the ambulance, and we all turned to see Miss Peregrine standing by as one of its rear tires hissed air. Miss Peregrine had voted with her beak by stabbing it into the ambulance's tire. Now, no one could use it. Not us, not injured persons, and there was no point in arguing or delaying any further. Well, that simplifies things, said Millard. We go on foot. Miss Peregrine! Bronwyn cried. How could you? Ignoring Bronwyn's indignation, Miss Peregrine hopped over to Molina, looked up at the pigeon on her shoulder, and screeched. The message was clear. Let's go already. What could we do? Time was wasting. Come with us, Emma said to Sam. If there's any justice in the world, we'll be somewhere safe before the night is through. I told you, I won't leave my sister behind, Sam replied. You're going to one of those places she can't enter, aren't you? I, I don't know, Emma stammered. It's possible. I don't care either way, Sam said coldly. After what I just saw, I wouldn't so much as cross the road with you. Emma drew, breath, drew back, going a bit pale. In a small voice, she asked, Why? 
If even outcast and downtrodden folk like yourselves can't muster a bit of compassion for others, she said, then there's no hope for this world. And she turned away and carried Esme toward the ambulance. Emma reacted as if she'd been slapped, her cheeks going red. She ran after Sam. We don't all think the way Enoch does. And as for our Imran, I'm sure she didn't mean to do what she did. Sam spun to face her. That was no accident. I'm glad my sister's not like all of you. Wish to God I wasn't. She turned away again, and this time Emma didn't follow. With wounded eyes, she watched Sam go, then slouched after the others. Somehow, the olive branch she'd extended had turned into a snake and bitten her. Bronwyn peeled off her sweater and set it down on the rubble. Next time bombs start falling, have your sister wear this, she called to Sam. It'll keep her safer than any bathtub. Sam said nothing, didn't even look. She was bending over the ambulance driver who was sitting up now and mumbling. I had the queerest dream. That was a stupid thing to do, Enoch said to Bronwyn. Now you don't have a sweater. Shut your fat gob, Bronwyn replied. If you'd ever done a nice thing for another person, you might understand. I did do something nice for, a per for another person, Enoch said, and it nearly got us eaten by hollows. We mumbled goodbyes that went unreturned and slipped quietly into the shadows. Melina took the pigeon from her shoulder and tossed it skyward. It flew a short distance before a string she tied around its foot snapped taut and it hovered, caught in the air like a dog straining at its leash. Miss Wren's this way, Melina said, nodding in the direction the bird was pulling, and we followed the girl and her pigeon friend down the alley. I was about to assume hollow watch, my now customary position near the head of the group, when something made me glance back at the sisters. I turned in time to see Sam lift Esme into the ambulance, then bend forward to plant a kiss on each of her scraped knees. I wondered what would happen to them. Later, Millard would tell me that the fact that none of them had ever heard of Sam, and someone with such a unique peculiarity would have been well known, meant she probably had not survived the war. The whole episode had really gotten to Emma. I don't know why it was so important for her to prove to a stranger that we were good-hearted when we knew ourselves to be, but the suggestion that we were anything less than angels walking the earth, that our natures were more complexly shaded, seemed to bother her. They don't understand, she kept saying. Then again, I thought, maybe mm -hmm. they do. We're going to go directly into chapter 11, and I'll tell you when the break is, since that was so short. Chapter 11. So it had come to this. Everything depended on a pigeon. Whether we would end the night in the womb-like safety of an embryon's care, or half-chewed in the churning black of a hollow's guts, whether Miss Peregrine would be saved, or we'd wander lost through this hellscape until her clock ran out whether I would live to see my home or my parents again. It all depended on one scrawny, peculiar pigeon. I walked at the front of the group, feeling for hollows, but it was really the pigeon who led us, tugging on its leash like a bloodhound after a scent. We turned left when the bird flew left, and right when it jerked right. Obedient mm -hmm. as sheep, even when it meant fumbling down streets, Cape cratered with ankle-breaking bomb holes or bristling with the bones of dismembered buildings, their jagged iron spear tips lurking dimly in the wavering fire glow angled at our throats. Coming down from the terrifying events of that evening, I had reached a new low of exhaustion. My head tingled strangely. My feet dragged. The rumble of bombs had quieted and the sirens had finally wound down and I wondered if all that apocalyptic noise had been keeping me awake. Now the smoky air was alive with subtler sounds. 
water gushing from broken manes, the whine of a trapped dog, hoarse vo voices moaning for help. Occasionally, fellow travelers would materialize out of the dark. Wraith-like figures escape from some lower world, eyes shining with fear and suspicion, clutching random things in their arms, radios, looted silver, a gift box, a funerary urn, dead bearing the dead. We came to a T in the road and stopped, the pigeon deliberating between left and right. The girl murmured encouragements. Come on, Winnie, there's a good pigeon. Show us the way. Enoch leaned in and whispered, If you don't find Miss Wren, I will personally roast you on a spit. The bird leapt into the air, urging left. Melina glowered at Enoch. You're an ass, she said. I get results, he replied. Eventually, we arrived at an underground station. The pigeon led us through its arc entry into a ticket lobby, and I was about to say, We're taking the subway, smart bird when I realized the lobby was deserted and the ticket booth shuttered. Though it didn't look like trains would be visiting the station anytime soon, we forged ahead regardless, through an unchained gate, along a hallway lined with peeling notices and chipped white tiles, to a deep staircase where we spiraled down and down into the city's humming, electric-lit belly. At each landing, we had to step around sleeping people wrapped in blankets, lone sleepers at first, then groups lying like scattered matchsticks, and then as we reached bottom, an unbroken human tide that swept across the underground platform. Hundreds of people squeezed between a wall and the tracks, curled on the floor, sprawled on benches, sunk into folding chairs. Those who weren't sleeping rocked babies in their arms read paperbacks, played cards, prayed. They weren't waiting for a train. No trains were coming. They were refugees from the bombs, and this was their shelter. I tried sensing for hollows, but there were too many faces, too many shadows. Luck, if we had any left, would have to sustain us for a while. Now what? We needed directions from the pigeon, but it seemed... Briefly confused, like me, it was probably overwhelmed by the crowd, so we stood and waited, the breaths and snores and mumbles of the sleepers murmuring weirdly around us. After a minute, the pigeon stiffened and flew toward the tracks then reached the end of its leash and bounced back into Melina's hand like a yo-yo. We tiptoed around the bodies to the edge of the platform, then hopped down into the pit where the tracks ran. They disappeared into tunnels on either end of the station. I had a sinking feeling that our future lay somewhere inside one of these dark, gaping mouths. Oh, I hope we don't have to go mucking about in there, said Olive. Of course we do, Enoch said. It isn't a proper holiday until we plumbed every available sewer. The pigeons bopped right the pigeon bopped rightward. We started down the tracks. I hopscotched around an oily puddle, and a legion of rats scurried away from my feet, sending Olive into Bronwyn's arms with a shriek. The tunnel yawned before us, black and menacing. It occurred to me that this would be a very bad place to meet a hollow ghast. Here There'd be no walls to climb, no houses to shelter in, no tomb lids to close behind us. It was long and straight and lit only by a few red bulbs glinting feebly at scattered intervals. I walked faster. The darkness closed around us. When I was a kid, I used to play hide-and-seek with my dad. I was always the hider and he the seeker. I was really good at it, primarily because I, unlike most kids of four or five, had the then peculiar ability to be extremely quiet for long periods of time, and also because I suffered from absolutely no trace of anything resembling claustrophobia. 
I could wedge myself into the smallest rear closet crawl space and stay there for 20 or 30 minutes, not making a sound, having the time of my life. Which is why you'd think I wouldn't have a problem with the whole dark enclosed spaces thing. Or why, at the very least, you'd think a tunnel meant to contain trains and tracks and nothing else would be easier for me to handle than one that was essentially an open cemetery, with all manner of Halloweenish things spilling out along it. And yet, the farther into this tunnel we walked, the more I was overcome by clammy, creeping dread, a feeling entirely apart from the one I sensed hollows with. This was simply a bad feeling. And so I hurried us through as fast as the slowest of us could go, prodding Melina until she barked at me to back off, a steady drip of adrenaline keeping my deep exhaustion at bay. After a long walk and several Y-shaped tunnel splits, the pigeon led us to a disused section of track where the ties had warped and rotted and pools of stagnant water spanned the floor. The pressure of trains passing in far-off tunnels pushed the air around like breaths in some great creature's gullet. Then, way down ahead of us, a pinpoint of light winked into being, small but growing fast. Emma shouted, Train! And we split apart and pressed our backs to the walls. I covered my ears, expecting the deafening roar of a train engine at close range, but it never came. All I could hear was a small, high-pitched whine, which I was fairly certain was coming from inside my own head. Just as the light was filling the tunnel, its white glow surrounding us, I felt a sudden pressure in my ears, and the lights disappeared. We stumbled away from the walls in a daze. Now the tracks and ties under our feet were new, as if they'd just been laid. The tunnel smelled somewhat less intensely of urine. The bulbs along it had gotten brighter, and instead of giving a steady light, they flickered. Because they weren't electric bulbs at all, but gas lamps. What just happened? I said. We crossed into a loop, said Emma. But what was that light? I've never seen anything like that. Every loop entrance has its quirks, said Millard. Anyone know when we are? I asked. I'd guess the latter half of the 19th century, said Millard. Prior to 1863, there wasn't an underground system in London at all. Then, from behind us, another light appeared, this one accompanied by a gust of hot wind and a thunderous roar. Train! Emma shouted again, and this time it really was. We threw ourselves against the walls as it shot past in a cyclone of noise and light and belching smoke. It looked less like a modern subway train than a miniature locomotive. It even had a caboose where a man with a big black beard and a guttering lantern in his hand gaped at us in surprise as the train strafed away around the next bend. Hugh's cap had blown off his head and been crushed. He went to pick it up, found it shredded, and threw it down again angrily. I don't care for this loop, he said. We've been here all of ten seconds. And already it's trying to kill us. Let's do what we have to and get gone. I couldn't agree more, said Enoch. The pigeon guided us down the track. After ten minutes or so, it stopped, pulling toward what looked like a blank wall. We couldn't understand why until I looked up and noticed a partially camouflaged door where the wall met the ceiling, twenty feet overhead. Because there seemed no other way to reach it, Olive took off her shoes and floated up to get, a to get a closer look. There's a lock on it, she said. A combination lock. There was also a pigeon-sized hole rusted through the door's bottom corner, but that was no help to us. We needed the combination. Any idea what it could be? Emma asked, putting the question out to everyone. She was met with shrugs and blank looks. None, said Millard. We'll have to guess, she said. Perhaps it's my birthday, said Enoch, 
Try 31292. Why would anyone know your birthday? said Hugh. Enoch frowned. Just try it. Olive spun the dial back and forth, then tried the lock. Sorry, Enoch. What What about our loop day? Horace suggested. Nine, three, forty. That didn't work either. It's not going to be something easy to guess like a date, said Millard. That would defeat the purpose of having a lock. Olive began to try random combinations. We stood by watching, growing more anxious with each failed attempt. Meanwhile, Miss Peregrine slipped quietly from Bronwyn's coat and hopped over to the pigeon who was waddling around at the end of its lead, pecking at the ground. When it saw Miss Peregrine, it tried to hop away, but the headmistress followed, making a low, vaguely threatening warble in her throat. The pigeon flapped its wings and flew up to Melina's shoulder out of Miss Peregrine's reach. Miss Peregrine stood by Melina's feet, squawking at it. This seemed to make the pigeon extremely nervous. Miss P, what are you up to? said Emma. I think she wants something from your bird. If the pigeon knows the way, said Millard, perhaps it knows the combination too. Miss Peregrine turned towards him and squawked, then looked back at the pigeon and squawked louder. The pigeon tried to hide behind Melina's back. Perhaps the pigeon knows the combination but doesn't know how to tell us, said Bronwyn. But it could tell Miss Peregrine, because both of them speak bird language, and then Miss Peregrine could tell us. Make your pigeon talk to our bird, said Enoch. Your bird's twice Winnie's size and sharp on three ends, Melina said, backing away a step. She's scared, and I don't blame her. There's nothing to be scared of, said Emma. Miss P would never hurt another bird. It's against the Embrun Code. Melina's eyes widened, then narrowed. That bird is an Embrun? She's our headmistress, said Bronwyn. Alma Le Fay Peregrine. Full of surprises, ain't you? Melina said, then laughed in a way that wasn't exactly friendly. If you've got an embryo right there, what do you need to find another one for? It's a long story, said Millard. Suffice to say, our embryo needs help that only another embryo can give. Just put the blasted pigeon on the ground so Miss P can talk to it, said Enoch. Finally, reluctantly, Melina agreed. Come on, Winnie, there's a good girl. She lifted the pigeon from her shoulder and placed it gently at her feet, then pinned its leash under her shoe so it couldn't fly away. Everyone circled around to watch as Miss Peregrine advanced on the pigeon. It tried to run, but was caught short by the leash. Miss Peregrine got right in its face, warbling and clucking. It was like watching an interrogation. The pigeon tucked its head under its wing and began to tremble. Then Miss Peregrine pecked it on the head. Hey, said Melina, stop that. The pigeon kept its head tucked and didn't respond, so Miss Peregrine pecked it again, harder. That's enough, Melina said, and lifted her shoe from the leash. She reached down for the pigeon. Before she could get her fingers around it, though, Miss Peregrine severed the leash with a quick slash of her talons, clamped it down clamped down with her beak on one of the pigeon's twiggy legs and bounded away, the pigeon screeching and flailing. Melina freaked out. Come back here, she shouted, furious, about to run after the birds when Bronwyn caught her by the arms. Wait, said Miss Bron said Bronwyn. I'm sure Miss P knows what she's doing. Miss Peregrine stopped a little way down the track, well out of anyone's reach. The pigeon struggled in her beak, and Melina struggled against Bronwyn, both in vain. Miss Peregrine seemed to be waiting for the pigeon to tire out and give up, but then she got impatient and began swinging the pigeon around in the air by its leg. Please, Miss P, Olive shouted. 
You'll kill it. I was close to rushing over and breaking it up myself, but the birds were a blur of talons and beaks, and no one could get close enough to separate them. We yelled and begged Miss Peregrine to stop. Finally, she did. The pigeon dropped from her mouth and wobbled on its feet, too stunned to flee. Miss Peregrine warbled at it the way she had earlier, and this time the pigeon chirped in response. Then Miss Peregrine tapped the ground with her beak three times, then ten times, then five. Three, ten, five. Olive tried the combination. The lock popped open, the door swung inward, and a rope ladder unrolled down the wall to meet the floor. Miss Peregrine's interrogation had worked. She'd done what she needed to do to help us all, and given that, we might have overlooked her behavior if not for what happened next. She took the dazed pigeon by its leg again and seemingly out of spite, flung it hard against the wall. We reacted with a great collective gasp of horror. I was shocked beyond speaking. Melina broke away from Bronwyn and ran to pick up the pigeon. It hung limply from her hand, its neck broken. Oh my bird, she's killed it, cried Bronwyn. All we went through to catch that thing, said Hugh, and now look. I'm going to stomp your Gimburn's head, Melina shrieked, crazed with rage. Bronwyn caught her arms again. No, you're not. Stop it. Jury Mern's a savage. If that's how she conducts herself, we're better off with the whites. You take that back, shouted Hugh. I won't, Melina said. More harsh words were exchanged. A fist fight was narrowly avoided. Bronwyn held Melina, and Emma and I held Hugh until the fight went out of them, if not the bitterness. No one could quite believe what Miss Peregrine had done. What's the big fuss? said Enoch. It was just a stupid pigeon. No, it wasn't, said Emma, scolding Miss Peregrine directly. That bird was a personal friend of Miss Wren's. It was hundreds of years old. It was written about in the tales, and now it's dead. Murdered, said Melina, as she spat on the ground. That's what it's called when you kill something for no reason. Miss Peregrine nibbled casually at a mite under her wing as if she hadn't heard any of this. Something wicked's gotten into her, said Olive. This isn't like Miss Peregrine at all. She's changing, said Hugh, becoming more animal. I hope there's still something human left in her to rescue, Millard said darkly. So did we all. We climbed out of the tunnel each of us lost in our own anxious thoughts. Beyond the door was a passage that led to a flight of steps that led to another passage and another door, which opened onto a room filled with daylight and packed to the rafters with clothes, racks and closets and wardrobes stuffed with them. There was also two wooden privacy screens to change behind some freestanding mirrors, and a work table laid out with sewing machines and bolts of raw fabric. It was half boutique, half workshop, and a paradise to Horace, who, who practically cartwheeled inside, crying, I'm in heaven! Melina lurked sullenly at the rear, not speaking to anyone. What is this place? I asked. It's a disguising room, Millard answered designed to help visiting peculiars blend in with this loop's normals. He pointed out a framed illustration demonstrating how clothes of the period were worn. When in Rome, said Horace, bounding toward a rack of clothes. Emma asked everyone to change. In addition to helping us blend in, new clothes might also throw off any whites who'd been tracking us. But keep your sweaters on underneath in case more trouble finds us. Bronwyn and Olive took some plain-looking dresses behind a screen. 
I traded my ash-coated, sweat-stained pants and jacket for a mismatched but relatively clean suit. Instantly uncomfortable, I wondered how, for so many centuries, people wore such stiff, formal clothes all the time. Millard put on a sharp-looking outfit and sat down in front of a mirror. How do I look? he said. Like an invisible boy wearing clothes, replied Horace. Millard sighed, lingering in front of the mirror a bit longer, then stripped and disappeared again. There's a picture. Horace's initial excitement had already waned. The selection here is atrocious, he complained. If the clothes aren't moth-eaten, they're patched with clashing fabric. I'm so weary of looking like a street urchin. Street urchins blend, Emma said from behind her changing screen. Little gents in top hats do not. She emerged wearing shiny red flats and a short-sleeved blue dress that fell just below the knee. What do you think? She said, twirling to make the dress billow. She looked like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, only cuter. I didn't know how to tell her this in front of everybody, though, so instead I gave her an awkward grin and a thumbs up. She laughed. Like it? Well, that's too bad, she said with a coy smile. I'd stick out like a sore thumb. Then a pained expression crossed her face as if she felt guilty for laughing for having had even a moment of fun, given all that had happened to us and everything yet to be resolved, and she ducked behind the screen again. I felt it, too, the dread, the weight of the horrors we'd seen, which replayed themselves in an endless, lurid loop in my mind. But you can't feel bad every second, I wanted to tell her. Laughing doesn't make bad things worse any more than crying makes them better. It doesn't mean you don't care or that you've forgotten. It just means you're human. But I didn't know how to say this, either. When she came out again, she had on a sack-like blouse with ripped sleeves and a broomstick skirt that brushed the top of her feet, much more urchin-like. She kept the red shoes, though. Emma could never resist a touch of glitter, however small. And this, said Horace, waving a poofy orange wig he'd found. How's this going to help anyone? blend in with the normals. Because it seems we're going to a carnival, said Hugh, looking up at a poster on the wall that advertised one. Just a moment, Horace said, joining Hugh beneath the poster. I've heard of this place. It's no tourist loop. What? What's a tourist loop? I asked. Used to be, you could find them all across Peculiardom, Millard explained, placed strategically at times and locations of historical import. They made up a sort of grand tour that was once considered an essential part of any well-bred Peculiar's education. This was many years ago, of course, and when it was still relatively safe to travel abroad, I didn't realize there were any left. Then he got quiet lost in memories of a better time. When we'd all finished changing, we left our 20th century clothes in a heap and followed Emma through another door, out into an alleyway stacked with trash and empty crates. I recognized the sounds of a carnival in the distance, the arithmetic wheeze of pipe organs, the dull roar of a, cl of a crowd. Even through my nerves and exhaustion, I felt a jangle of excitement. Once, this was something peculiars had come from far and wide to see. My parents had never even taken me to Disney World. Emma gave the usual instructions. Stay together. Watch Jacob and me for signals. Don't talk to anyone and look no one in the eye. How will we all know where to go? Asked Olive. We'll have to think like inbreds, Emma said. If 
you are Miss Wren. Where would you be hiding? Anywhere but London, said Enoch. If only someone hadn't murdered the pigeon, Bronwyn said, staring bitterly at Miss Peregrine. The headmistress stood on the cobblestones looking up at us, but no one wanted to touch her. We had to keep her out of sight, though, so Horace went back into the disguising room and fetched a denim sack. Miss Peregrine wasn't enthusiastic about this arrangement, but when it became clear that no one was going to pick her up, least of all Bromlin, who seemed entirely disgusted with her, she climbed inside and let Horace knot the top closed with a strip of leather. We followed the drunken sound of the carnival through a snarl of cramped lanes where from wooden carts vendors hawked vegetables and dusty sacks of grain and freshly killed rabbits where children and thin cats skulked and prowled with hungry eyes and women with proud, dirty faces squatted in the gutter peeling potatoes, buildings like mountains with the tossed away skins. Though we tried very hard to slink by unnoticed, Every one of them seemed to turn and stare as we passed. The vendors, the children, the women, the cats, the dead, milk-eyed rabbits swinging by their legs. Even in my new period-appropriate clothes, I felt transparently out of place. Blending in was as much about performance as about costume, I realized. And my friends and I carried ourselves with none of the slump-shouldered, shifty-eyed attitude that these people did. In the future... If I wanted to disguise myself as effectively as the whites, I'd have to sharpen my acting skills. The carnival grew louder as we went, and the smells stronger. Overcooked meats, roasting nuts, horse manure, human manure, and the smoke from coal fires, all mixing together into something so sickly sweet that it thickened the very air. Finally, we reached a wide square where the carnival was in full, rollicking swing packed with masses of people and brightly colored tents and more activity than my eyes could take in all at once. The whole scene was an assault on my senses. There were acrobats and rope dancers and knife throwers and fire eaters and street performers of every type. A quack doctor pitched patent medicines from the back of a wagon. A rare cordial to fortify the innards against ineffective parasites, unwholesome damps, and malignant effluvia competing for attention on an adjacent stage with a loud-mouthed showman in coattails and a large, prehistoric-looking creature whose gray skin hung from its frame in cascading wrinkles. It took me ten full seconds as we threaded the crowd past the stage to recognize it as a bear. It had been shaved and tied to a chair and made to wear a woman's dress, and as its eyes bulged in its head, the showman grinned and pretended to serve serve at tea, shouting, Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the most beautiful lady in all of Wales, which earned him a big laugh from the crowd. I half hoped it would break its chains and eat him right there in front of everyone. To combat the dizzying effect of all this dreamlike madness, I reached into my pocket to palm the smooth glass of my phone, eyes closed for a moment, and whispered to myself, I am a time traveler. This is real. I, Jacob Portman, am traveling in time. This was astonishing enough. More astonishing, perhaps, was the fact that time travel hadn't broken my brain, that by some miracle I had not yet devolved into a gibbering crazy person ranting on a street corner. The human psyche was much more flexible than I'd imagined, capable of expanding to contain all sorts of contradictions and seeming impossibilities. Lucky for me. Olive, Bronwyn shouted, get away from there. I looked up to see her yank Olive away from a clown who had bent down to talk to her. I've told you time and again, never talk to normals. Our group was large enough that keeping it together could be a challenge, especially in a place like this, full of distractions tailor-made to fascinate children. Bronwyn acted as den mother, rounding us up every time one of us strayed to get a closer look at a stall of 
Brightly colored pinwheels are streaming boiled or er, steaming boiled candy. Olive was the most easily distractible and often seemed to forget that we were in serious danger. It was only possible to keep so many kids in line because there were not actually they were not actually kids because there was some older nature inside them warring against and balancing their childish impulses. With actual children, I'm sure it would have been hopeless. For a while, we wandered aimlessly, looking for anyone who resembled Miss Wren, or anywhere it seemed peculiars were likely to hide. But everything here seemed peculiar. This entire loop, with all its chaotic strangeness, was perfect camouflage for peculiars. And yet, even here, people noticed us, their heads turning subtly as we passed. I started to get paranoid. How many of the people around us were spies for the whites? or whites themselves. I was especially wary of the clown, the one Bronwyn had pulled Olive away from. He kept turning up. We must have passed him five times in as many minutes, loitering at the mouth of an alley, staring down from a window, watching us from a tinted photo booth, his must hair and horrific makeup clashing bizarrely with a backdrop painting of bucolic countryside. He seemed to be everywhere at once. It's not good being out in the open like this, I said to Emma. We can't just circle around forever. People are noticing us. Clowns. Clowns, she said. Anyway, I agree with you, but it's difficult to know where to start in all this madness. We should start at what is always the most peculiar part of any carnival, said Enoch, butting between us. The sideshow. He pointed to it at a tall, gaudy facade at the edge of the square. Sideshows and peculiars go together like milk and cookies, or hollows and whites. Usually they do, said Emma, but the whites know that as well. I'm sure Miss Wren hasn't kept her freedom this long by hiding in such obvious places. Have you got a better idea? said Enoch. We didn't, and so we shifted direction toward the sideshow. I looked back for the leering crowd, for the leering clown, but he had melted into the crowd. And here's a photo of a creepy clown. Uh, have fun with that. Then again, I think all clowns are creepy. So we're gonna take a break for a second. Yeah. I just don't like clowns. I just don't like them. I'm not necessarily afraid of clowns. I just think they're off-putting. Maybe that's just me. I am just not a fan. <laughs> I <pr> you weren't here at the top, but I warned everybody. I was like, "Is anybody like afraid of clowns?" <laughs> cool food is half done. I've been seeing uh, recipe updates sort of flash. I haven't been able to like fully read them. They made me lose my place at one point. <laughs> So I stopped trying to read them. <laughs> but thank you for feeding me. I'm struggling. Uh, I do I do have my coffee slash protein shake that I haven't been... I prefer to drink water while I'm reading because it's the most inoffensive to, thing to drink while reading out loud. <laughs> But, um, I made this earlier as sort of like a meal replacement option because I didn't want to cook. Oh, okay, so it was, um, the Isabella Cold Brew from Kitty Town Coffee. I had made a bunch as cold brew. And I mixed it with chocolate protein powder. <laughs> 
the protein powder is somewhat overwhelming it. Um, which is fine. It doesn't necessarily taste bad. But it would be very easy to drink this and be like, there's not coffee in here. Like... No, I would hazard to say there's almost, it's, it's pretty much 50-50 in the, those are the only two ingredients. I didn't do anything fancy. I had a, ment I had a mental breakdown yesterday. I had to schedule my mental, mental breakdown <laughs> for yesterday. So I uh, have not been feeling super motivated to do a whole lot. <laughs> So we are doing what is functional. Um, as long as it works, and that's what we're doing. Uh, but that is the coffee I used. Uh, you cannot tell. Um, I was hoping it would taste like more like coffee and like less like chocolate. <laughs> I did not get that. I did not get that experience. Uh, that was unfortunate. But it, it's it's working. It's fine. It's functional, and we're okay. Doing doing the bare minimum. You're so on top of it. I cleaned my kitchen earlier. I guess I'm sort of on top of it. I didn't, I, I, I didn't achieve very much today for what I wanted to achieve. I achieved 20% of that. <laughs> but 20 is better than zero. <laughs> and yesterday I achieved 0%. Um, exactly. Check my P.O. box. That's Right, I actually ordered something to go to my video box, so uh, I guess I will check it um, tomorrow when I get up. Hopefully, I'm, I keep, I have chores. I keep having to do during normal business hours, and that doesn't jive with my schedule a lot, but I already have to get up and call. I, I have so much paperwork. <laughs> I have just been, <laughs> I have just been bogged down in paperwork for the fa for the past <laughs> 24 to 72 hours. No, I keep trying to call to um, get my birth certificate changed and they just aren't calling me back. They keep, they keep transferring me to a voicemail. And I leave a message, I left so many messages at this point, no one calls me back. And I'm like... I don't know what to do. They won't transfer me to an actual person anyway. And I have to get a hold of the insurance company, but the insurance company basically said they need that updated. Anyway, it's a whole big thing. I need stuff to be updated before I update it somewhere else, and then I can't get through to the people I need to update it to, and then it just it becomes a whole thing. super fun. <laughs> it's a whole hassle. This is the worst. And the thing is, is that this, 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 is, a, this is a victory thing. I, I did the thing. I did a thing and I should be happy that I did it. And I, it's erasing the fun. The government is erasing the satisfaction from this. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Things that you didn't even think about. Things you don't even think about. Think in, like, okay, for instance, I have been, I got my card, my bank card, like my debit card, uh, in the mail. Name, names changed, which is great for me. But I have, I went to... PetSmart <laughs> a few weeks ago for cat food. Got the cat food. Up, But the thing is, is that I've done this multiple times and each time I give them my phone number, um, it is registered under both my dead name and Dave's name. And they assume I am Dave. 
and now the card is changed and normally I go there with cash and I went there today and I realized as I'm walking up to the register I was like oh I can't give them my phone number because if I give them my phone number it's gonna pull up two people on the account that are not the name on the debit card that I have to use now so I just lied. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> and I didn't want to go through that. So I was just like, they were like, do you have a phone number registered? And I was like, no. No. And you, you got to change all that. You got to change your PayPal. I'm going to change my PayPal. <laughs> I ordered those contacts. <laughs> Fantastic. I ordered the contact. <laughs> and I just now remembered that I didn't change it on my PayPal, so now I gotta change it on the PayPal so that I get my contacts. Solid. Solid stuff. Succeeding at life. Doing great. No, um, it's just a lot to think about and stay on top of, and you don't it's almost impossible to keep track of everything, but I've gotten the bulk of what I, need, I needed to get changed, changed. I just, it's really just these two things left that are really impactful that I really need to get done. Or else my health insurance is gonna lapse. And I, Do you hear that? That was a whole chopper. Okay, good. I was like, sounds like that's flying pretty low. <laughs> there was a helicopter and it just sounded like it was flying real low. And I was like, what are you doing? No. Also, extra long mic cord I ordered so long. It's so long. It's like eight feet long. Just in case Pawn comes in here and tries to jump over, she won't get tied up because it's there's like it, it's on the floor. So there's no ripping out. There's no she won't trip on any cords. Now if she wants to take down this ring light, she's gonna have to headbutt the actual ring light. <laughs> Tell it to get out of your airspace. <laughs> if I thought that would make a difference, I would. All right, we are jumping back into this thing. Who is ready to go back in for the rest of chapter 11? <laughs> I, uh, she can be cute without knocking shit over. She's very cute without knocking shit over. All right, sweet. At the sideshow, a scruffy carnival barker was shouting through a megaphone, promising glimpses of the most shocking airs of nature allowed on view by law for a trivial fee. It was called the Congress of Human Oddities. Sounds like dinner parties I've attended, said Horace. Some of these oddities might be peculiar, said Millard, in which case they might know something about Miss Wren. I'd say it's worth the price of admission. We don't have the price of admission, said Horace, pulling a single lint-flecked coin from his pocket. Since when have we ever paid to get into a sideshow? said Enoch. We followed Enoch around the back of the sideshows where its wall-like facade gave way to a big, flimsy tent. We were scouting for openings, openings to slip through when a flat pulled back and a well-dressed man and woman burst out, the man holding the lady, the lady fanning herself. Move aside, the man barked. This woman needs air. A sign above the flap read, Performers Only. We slipped inside and were immediately stopped. A plain-looking boy sat on a tufted stool near the entrance, apparently in some official capacity. You performers, he said. Can't come in unless you're performers. Feigning offense, Emma said, 
Of course we're performers. And to demonstrate, she made a tiny flame on the tip of her finger and stubbed it out in her eye. The boy shrugged, unimpressed. Go on, then. We shuffled past him, blinking, our eyes adjusting slowly to the dark. The sideshow was a low-ceiling maze of canvas, a single dramatically torch-lit aisle that took sharp turns every twenty or thirty feet, so that around each corner we were confronted by a new abomination of nature. A trickle of spectators, some laughing, others pale and shaking, stumbled past us in the opposite direction. In more pictures for you guys. I also miss NMopter. The first few freaks were a standard issue sideshow fair, and not especially peculiar. In illustrated, man covered in tattoos, a bearded lady stroking her long chin whiskers and cackling, a human pincushion who pierced his face with needles and drove nails into his nostrils with a hammer. While I thought this was pretty impressive, my friends, some of whom have traveled Europe in a sideshow with Miss Peregrine, could hardly stifle their yawns. Under a banner that read, The Amazing Matchstick Men, of a gentleman with hundreds of matchbooks glued to his suit, body slammed a man similarly clothed in matchsticks, causing flames to erupt across the matchstick man's chest as he flailed in fake terror. Amateurs, Emma muttered as she pulled us on to the next attraction. The oddities got progressively odder. There was a girl in a long fringe dress who wore a giant python around her body, which wriggled and danced at her command. Emma allowed that this was at least marginally peculiar, since the ability to enchant snakes was something only Sindragosti could do, but when Emma mentioned Miss Wren to the girl, she gave us a hard stare, and her snake hissed and showed its fangs, and we moved on. We have another picture here. Picture two, or five, or something. I don't know how many we've had now. This is a waste of time, said Enoch. Miss Peregrine's clock is running out and we're touring a carnival. Why not get some sweets and make a day of it? There was only one more freak to see, though, so we continued on. The final stage was empty, but for a plain backdrop, a small table with flowers on it and an easel prop sign that read, The World Famous Folding Man. A stagehand walked onto the stage, lugging a suitcase. He set the case down and left. A crowd gathered. The suitcase sat there, center stage. People began to shout, On with the show! And bring out the freak! The suitcase jiggled. Then it began to shake, wobbling back and forth until it toppled onto its side. The crowd pressed toward the stage, fixated 
on the case. The latches popped, and very slowly the case began to open. A pair of white eyes peeped out at the crowd, and then the case opened a little more to reveal a face, that of an adult man with a nearly neatly trimmed mustache and little round glasses, who had somehow folded himself into a suitcase no larger than my torso. The crowd burst into applause, which increased as the freak proceeded to unfold himself, limb by limb, and step out of the impossibly small case. He was very tall and as skinny as a bean pole, so alarmingly thin, in fact, that it looked as if his bones were about to break through the skin. He was a human exclamation point, but carried himself with such dignity that I couldn't laugh at him. He studied the hooting crowd dourly before taking a deep bow. He then took a minute to demonstrate how his limbs could bend in all sorts of exotic ways, his knee twisting so that the top of his foot touched his hip, then his hips folding so that the knee touched his chest, and after more applause and more bows, the show was over. We lingered as the crowd filtered away. The folding man was leaving the stage when Emma said to him, You're peculiar, aren't you? The man stopped. He turned slowly to look at her with an air of imperious annoyance. Excuse me, he said in a thick Russian accent. Sorry to corner you this way, but we need to find Miss Wren, Emma said. We know she's here someplace. Puh, said the man, dismissing her with a noise halfway between laughing and hawking spit. It's an emergency, Bronwyn pleaded. The folding man crossed his arms in a bony X and said, I don't know anything what you say, then walked off the stage. And here's a picture. I didn't, I thought about terming this body horror, but it didn't really seem too bad of like a description. Anyway, he's just real skinny. But then again, some people might find that disturbing. I'm not sure. Then again, I might have a skewed vision of what body horror is. So I hope that... Maybe I should have prefaced this. I always doubt myself when I'm making stuff for these. I anyway, mean, hopefully it's okay. I'm sorry if anybody didn't like that. Um, now what? Asked Bronwyn. We keep looking, said Emma. And if we don't find Miss Wren, said Enoch. We keep looking, Emma said through her teeth. Everyone understand? Everyone understood perfectly well. We were out of options. If this didn't work, if Miss Wren wasn't here, or we couldn't find her soon, then all our efforts would have been for nothing, and Miss Peregrine would be lost just the same as if we'd never come to London at all. We walked out of the sideshow the way we'd come, dejected, past the now empty stages, past the plain looking boy, out of the tent and into the daylight. We were standing outside the tent, the exit, unsure of what to do next, when the plain looking boy leaned out through the flap. What's the trouble? he said. Show weren't to your liking? It was fine, I said, waving him off. Not peculiar enough for you? He asked. That got her attention. What did you say? said Emma. Wakeling and Rookery, he said, pointing past us toward the far side of the square. That's where the real show is. And then he winked at us and ducked back inside the tent. That was mysterious, said Hugh. Did he say peculiar? said Bronwyn. What's Wakeling and Rookery? I said. A place, said Horace. Some place in this loop, maybe. Could be the intersection of two streets, said Emma, and she pulled back the tent flap to ask the boy if this was what he meant but he was already gone. 
So we set off through the crowd toward the far end of the square where he pointed. Our one last thin hope pinned to a couple of oddly named streets we weren't even sure existed. There was a point a few blocks beyond the square where the noise of the crowd faded and was replaced by an industrial clank and clamor and the rich funk of roasting meat and animal waste was replaced by a stench far worse and unnameable. Crossing a walled river of Stygian sludge, we entered a district of factories and workhouses of smokestacks belching black stuff into the sky and this is where we found Wakeland Street. We walked one way down Wakeling, looking for rookery, until it dead-ended at a large open sewer, which Enoch said was the River Fleet, then turned and came back the other way. When we'd passed the point along Wakeling where we'd started, the street began to curve and twist, the factories and workhouses shrinking down into squat offices and unassuming buildings with blank faces and no signs, like a neighborhood purpose-built to be anonymous. The bad feeling I'd been nursing got worse. What if we'd been set up, sent to this deserted part of the city, to be ambushed out of view? The street twisted and straightened again, and then I crashed into Emma, who'd been walking in front of me, but had come to a sudden stop. What's the matter? I said. In lieu of an answer, she just pointed. Up ahead at a T-shaped intersection, there was a crowd. Though it had been sticky hot back at the carnival, many of them were bundled in coats and scarves. They were assembled around a particular building and stood gazing up at a dumbfounded wonder, just as we were now. The building itself was nothing special. Four stories, the top three just rows of narrow, rounded windows, like an old office building. It was, in fact, nearly identical to all the buildings around it, with one exception. It was totally encased in ice. Ice coated its windows and doors. Icicles hung like fangs from every sill and ledge. Snow spilled from its doorways, collecting in giant heaps on the sidewalk. It looked like a blizzard had struck the building from the inside. I peered at a snow-blasted street sign, R. Carey Street. I know this place, said Melina. It's the peculiar archives, where all our official records are kept. How do you know that? said Emma. Miss Thrush was grooming me to be the second assistant to the ombudswoman through. The examination's very difficult. I've been studying for 21 years. Is it supposed to be covered in ice like that? asked Bronwyn. Not that I'm aware said Melina. It's also where the Council of Imbrins convene for the annual nitpicking of the bylaws, said Millard. The Council of Imbrins meet here, said Horace. It's awfully humble. I expected a castle or some such. It's not meant to stand out, said Melina. You aren't supposed to notice it at all. Then they're doing a poor job of keeping it hidden, then, said Enoch. As I said, it's not usually covered in ice. What do you think happened here? I asked. Nothing good, said Millard. Nothing good at all. Here's a picture of the building. There was no question we'd have to get closer and explore, but that didn't mean we had to rush in like fools. We hung back and watched from a distance. People came and went. Someone tried the door, but it was frozen shut. The crowd thinned a bit. Tick, 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 said Enoch. We're wasting time. We cut through what was left of the crowd and stepped onto the icy sidewalk. The building emanated cold 
and we shivered and jammed our hands into our pockets against it. Bronwyn used her strength to pull open the door, and it came straight off, hinges flying, but the hallway it led onto was completely obstructed by ice. It stretched from wall to wall, floor to ceiling, and into the building in a blue and cloudy blur. The same was true of the windows. I wiped the frost from one pane and then another, and through both I could see only ice. It was as if a glacier was being born somewhere in the heart of the place, and its frozen tongues were squeezing out wherever there was an opening. We tried every way we could think of to get inside. We rounded the building, looking for a door or window that wasn't blocked, but every potential entrance was filled with ice. We picked up stones and loose bricks and tried hacking at the ice, but it was almost supernaturally hard. Even Bronwyn could dig no more than a few inches into it. Millard scanned the tales for any mention of the building, but there was nothing, no secrets to be found. Finally, we decided to take a calculated risk. We formed a semicircle around Emma to block her from view, and she heated her hands and placed them against the ice wall that filled the hallway. After a minute, they began to sink into the ice, meltwater trickling down to puddle around our feet. But the progress was painfully slow, and after five minutes, she had only gotten up to her elbows. At this rate, it'll take the rest of the week just to get down to the hall, she said, pulling her arms from the ice. Mm -hmm. Do you think Miss Wren could really be inside? said Bronwyn. She has to be, Emma said firmly. I find this contagion of optimism positively flabbergasting, said Enoch. If Miss Wren is in there, then she's frozen solid. Emma erupted at him. Doom and gloom, ruin and ruination. I think you'd be happy if the world came to an end tomorrow, just so you could say I told you so. Enoch blinked at her, surprised, then said very calmly, You may choose to live in a world of fantasy if you like, my dear but I am a realist. If you ever offered more than simple criticism, Emma said, if you ever gave a single useful suggestion during a crisis, rather than just shrugging your shoulders at the prospect of failure and death, I might be able to tolerate your unrelenting black moods, but as it's... We tried everything, Enoch interjected. What could I possibly suggest? There's one thing we haven't tried, Olive said, piping up from the edge of our group. And what's that? asked Emma. Olive decided to show rather than tell us. Leaving the sidewalk, she went into the crowd, turned to face the building, and called at the top of her lungs. Hello, Miss Wren. If you're in there, please come out. We need your... Before she could finish, Bronwyn had tackled her, and the rest of all of the sentence was delivered into the big girl's armpit. Are you insane? Bronwyn said, bringing Olive back to us under her arm. You're going to get us all found out. She set Olive on the sidewalk and was about to chastise her further when tears began streaming down the little girl's face. It doesn't matter if we're found out, Olive said. If we can't find Miss Wren, and we can't save Miss Peregrine. What does it matter if the whole white army descends on us right now? A lady stepped out of the crowd and approached us. She was older, back bent with age, her face partly obscured by the hood of a cloak. Is she all right? The lady asked. She's fine, thank you, Emma said dismissively. I'm not, said Olive. Nothing is right. All we ever wanted was to live in peace on our island, and then bad things came and hurt our headmistress, and now all we want to do is help her, and we can't even do that. Olive hung her head and began to weep pitifully. Well then, said the woman, it's an awfully good thing you came to see me. Olive looked up, sniffed, and said, Why is that? 
And then the woman vanished. Just like that. She disappeared right out of her clothes, and her cloak, suddenly empty, collapsed onto the pavement with an airy whoomp. We were all too stunned to speak until a small bird came hopping out from beneath the folds of the cloak. I froze, not sure if I should try to catch it. Does anyone know what sort of bird that is? asked Horace. I believe that's a wren, said Millard. The bird flapped its wings, leapt into the air, and flew away, disappearing around the side of the building. Don't lose her, Emma shouted, and we all took off running after it, slipping and sliding on the ice, rounding the corner into the snow-choked alley that ran between the glaciated building and the one next to it. The bird was gone. Drat, Emma said. Where'd she go? Then a series of odd sounds came up from the ground beneath our feet. Metallic clanks, voices, and a noise like water flushing. We kicked the snow away to find a pair of wooden doors set into the bricks like the entrance to a coal cellar. The doors were unlatched. We pulled them open. Inside were steps that led down into the dark, covered in quick melting ice. The meltwater draining loudly into an unseen gutter. And here's a picture. Emma crouched and called into the darkness. Hello? Is anyone there? If you're coming, returned a distant voice. Come quickly. Emma stood up, surprised, then shouted, Who are you? We waited for an answer. None came. What are we waiting for? said Olive. It's Miss Wren. We don't know that, said Millard. We don't know what happened here. Well, I'm going to find out, Olive said, and before anyone could stop her, she'd gone to the cellar doors and leapt through them, floating gently to the bottom. I'm still alive, her voice taunted us from the dark, and so we were shamed into following her and climbed down the steps to find a passage tunnel through thick ice. Freezing water dripped from the ceiling and ran down the walls in a steady stream. And it wasn't completely dark. After all, gauzy light glowed from around a turn in the passage ahead. We heard footsteps approaching. A shadow climbed the wall in front of us. Then a cloaked figure appeared at the turn in the passage, silhouetted in the light. Hello, children, the figure said. I and Balenciaga Wren, and I am so pleased you are here. And that is the end of chapter 11. Bam. Okay. And we have exactly 15 minutes. awesome because since you've talked about it I've now actually achieved hunger so score okay oh I just can't I don't I don't I don't have any motivation to put effort into feeding myself anything that would constitute as actual food Now we're to the part you haven't read past. Awesome. Um, sick. Glad that we achieved that. We are now at the... We, this is... Uh, 
the ending of book two. <laughs> Once again, not my fault. It's Ransom Riggs' fault. Not my fault. Cliffhanger. Bad cliffhanger. I just want to remind everybody that, that one, it is not my fault. Don't blame me. And we're going to do the third book, obviously. So I just want everybody to know that. Heading in to the last stretch of this because we're we're almost we're almost to the end here um is what i'm getting at um there are like only two chapters i think yes thank you not my fault <laughs> yeah so just remember that let's keep that in the back here it's I didn't structure it this way. Oh, it is one of the worst. It was one of the worst cliffhangers I've ever fucking read in my life. And I was like, you ended the book there. The book, not a chapter. That would have been a great lead off for a chapter. The ending of this book made me wonder if like Ransom Riggs just does not he doesn't care about death. <laughs> he doesn't care if anybody who reads his words are going to be personally uh, very vindictive. I was like, man, you really did that and didn't expect at least one fan to send you a death threat. Um, oh, I am so glad that I have read this after the entirety of the series was published. Because if I had been following along, I would be so, I would feel so very, very angry. I, <laughs> oof. And then, as I understand it, I had a good long stretch before the third book was published. And I was like, how did you survive? How did you survive, sir? Did you... Oh my god. I wouldn't have said any crossword, but I would have thought plenty of them and kept them to myself. I will say that. <laughs> would have been upset. So, thank you. Appreciate it. Oh my god. The... I feel personally like that man's gonna die before he finishes. <laughs> like, it's not. <laughs> it's a... And if any of you have ever read Patrick Rothfuss, uh, The Name of the Wind, or any. <laughs> I don't think he's gonna win. I feel like that's been personally abandoned. Worse than AO3 ever could. <laughs> like, that is... The, at some point... I was like, you can't do that if you're an author. You can do that if you're, like, some dipshit on AO3 making stuff and then you're like, this is gonna be a really long thing and then you stop after chapter two and then you get sunk into it and you're like, great, there's no more. Um, or worse, you get 13 chapters in and then they're, like, abandoned and we're like, I'm sorry, what? It feels so weird that you could just do that as an author because a publishing house had to pick it up, right? A pub you have a publisher. You have an editor. You've deadlines at least a suggestion of a deadline and then you shot straight past that and kept going for years and i feel like at a certain point i'm like at which point <laughs> i'm still waiting on on the next one i'm still waiting after the year it feels so bad okay I don't give a fuck that Stephanie Knight, but that the. 
I, but yeah, it's, do you just, so like you signed a deal for, how did you do that? Because man, Name of the Wind was so good. So good. And we're never gonna know. We're never gonna know. If you haven't read Name of the Wind, read it, but be prepared for heartbreak. Anyway, because you're never gonna know the end. <laughs> Who's ready for Cat <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Catfax. We were in the middle of, of options of where to get cats. It was kind of, I've just sort of been breaking it up into pieces because uh, it's supposed to be kind of short little addendum to the series so we were in the middle of where to get cats and we're at friends and neighbors so we gotta get you gotta think that their voicemail boxes are full of messages from the i know how do you wake up in the morning with that kind of stress on you how do you wake up oh okay, I, if i had if i have like a deadline of something that i gotta do for work it's getting done pretty much right away like I start, like, I have, like, side work or, like, closing work to do before we get done for the day. I start that shit at 10. We close at 2. I am on top of it. Like, I, it is for work. It's done. Now, if it's anything personally that I gotta do, I forget about it and then stress myself out about it later. But if it's something that I gotta do, like, a deadline, like, homework or fucking stuff for work i am on top of it do it immediately better now than later like but you just straight up just didn't do it it's so many sleepless nights do we get i yeah because i feel like that would be stress but then i feel like like People like George R. R. Martin are just like, I'll get to it when I get to it. And I'm like, <laughs> no. I can't. Anyway, cat facts. The odds are somebody you know has a cat or kittens in need of a home. Many times, taking a cat from a neighbor or a friend works out best for everyone, especially if it's a kitten from your neighbor's cat litter or an allergic family, family pet. Your personal relationship with this source usually means you'll get the straight story on this particular cat, too. A couple of warnings about getting your cat from a friend or a neighbor, though. Don't expect a cat to have the extensive vet care that a care from a shelter or a breeder has, and be careful about mixing business and friendship. That's all that this one was. That's your cat. Always take your cat to the vet. I don't care where you got it. Always take your cat to the vet. Always, always make sure. Get that cat. Get the cat at shots. Get, get, get your pets vaccinated. Anyway, sorry. There's. I've known so many people who get a pet from another person, be it a cat or a dog or whatever, and don't take it to the vet to get it vaccinated. Get your pets vaccinated. I don't care where you got it. Yes, and if you have other pets, like if I had like oof, one, depending on the type of animal that you have as a pet, if it's not fixed, it's just going to cause you a lot of problems. Definitely, if you have, like, two cats, and one of them's male, and one of them's female, and you're not intending to make kittens, don't do it. Also, it's just a good idea, because in varying ages and different um, gendered animals, sometimes you won't end up with kittens, you end up with a pissing contest, and that's just as bad. 
<laughs> Literally sometimes. A pissing contest. Don't... Don't put yourself through that. <laughs> Don't put yourself through that. You ever had an animal mark a book? Because I have anyway. Or a blanket. Your favorite blanket. Ugh. Ruin now. Ruin now. Don't let him do that. <laughs> yes. Feline leukemia is so... A cap. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, there are sirens outside, and then just I'm here. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Do you hear the sirens, and then I just get I'm here. <laughs> Perfect timing. I know, right? That was. Phenomenal. Okay, we're gonna move to Discord. Um, we're gonna stream. I'll try streaming Hollow Knight for you guys and see how I do. I don't know. I don't have high hopes, but we're gonna try it. And I'm gonna eat this. I'm gonna eat this. Um, so I'll see you in a few minutes. We are actually gonna have a little bit of a break, even though I have everything set up because I want to eat. Thank you for understanding. Um, and if you all want to come back here, I don't know, just a suggestion on Tuesday at 8. Um, I'll see you then, and we'll do it again. You know the drill. Okay, bye guys. Good night, Toby. <laughs>